Okay, welcome back to session 12 of 120B 220B. Today we are going to continue the whole the structural analysis, actually work in those structural analysis packages and show you how they can actually help us complete our structural modeling workflow by helping us size the different members that might be necessary to carry some of the critical loads and then uh, actually bring those member sizes back to the building model. So it's kind of a nice round trip system that actually allows you to work with a single model and uh, not have to recreate a series of different models. So it's nice that you can do it that way. The problem always with creating multiple models is as soon as you create two different version models of the building, like uh, one is guaranteed to be, to be out of date. As soon as anyone changes anything in one of the models, then the other one is always going to start being a little bit out of sync. It's almost like I'm wearing two watches. We're never quite sure which is the right time. Uh, having two different models that aren't really related to each other, aren't really based on the same model, just invites a lot of problems. So it is very, very good to go ahead and be working at a single model. And hopefully this um, foray of the structural analysis will demonstrate how it is possible to do that and kind of keep those two different models in sync. Where we're going to be heading towards the end of class today, though, is shifting gears and starting to move into the mechanical systems that are actually inside of a building. We're going to look at a lot of different mechanical systems. We're going to look about how we use air to both heat and cool buildings, as well as just ventilate the buildings and keep them fresh. Today we're going to uh, like uh, specifically look at the ventilation side, so just moving air around is necessary to kind of keep the building just generally fresh and uh, healthy, things like that, and then add heating and uh, cooling to it. Um, after that, we'll go ahead and look at mechanical systems and electrical systems, or excuse me, plumbing systems and electrical systems. So ultimately, we'll cover a little bit of all of those things. But what that means relative to where you want to be in your own projects is, uh, as you are checking in and talking to us this week, the idea is it's a really good time to sort of have most of your structural framing elements sort of uh, in place, if not size, just making sure that your overall strategy is sort of there so we understand where there's going to be beams, where there's going to be columns, where there's going to be some structural walls so that we can start thinking about start reducing that structural sizing. But we want to go through and pretty much have your structure complete, okay, as complete as it's going to be here. Realizing, of course, that you won't have all the members sized and fully analyzed and stuff like that. The scope of doing that is really well beyond what we're going to do in this class. But it'd be great to go through and even as you're meeting with us, we can kind of pick together some interesting condition that would be useful to look at in the analysis so that you can like, uh, sort of figure out what that beam is that's carrying an unusual cantilever, or what the size of the beam is that's going to be exceptionally loaded, just so you get the experience of what it's like to go through and do the sizing and carry it on back. So we'll go through and that's a good spot to be at in the overall process. Go ahead and we'll start with the analysis, then I'm going to go into model integration. So we'll talk about all these different views of the model. Peter was asking some really interesting questions about A360, BIM360, when to use each, and how they all sort of contrast with each other. And we'll try to illustrate and try to demonstrate what they're each good for. They're sort of good for different things, but they both have limitations in terms of how shareable they are or how integrated a picture of the building they give you our ideas. In a way, it's sort of like, uh, in my dream world, A360 and BIM360 would sort of merge together into a single system because they do different things. And we'll head towards ventilation. But let's go ahead and start with structural analysis. So the idea is that we were basically preparing an analytical model last time. And when I mean preparing it, it's basically to go through and put some any floors that are going to be carrying some loads into sort of horizontal surfaces that are going to carry loads, kind of make them structural. If we have some walls that will be carrying things, make them structural walls. If the columns and beams are there, those are probably already in good shape. But we need to add boundary conditions and then some loads to go through and take to the analysis tool. And that's where it really all got started. From there, we then start taking it towards analysis. And in terms of analysis, there were a couple of main plugins that I think are probably the most useful for you. There's the Structural Analysis Toolkit, which should now be installed in all the machines. Uh, Nikos actually went around and installed it on everything. So from the Structural Analysis Toolkit, I'll show you, you can send a report directly to the cloud and even avoid going to robot structural analysis at all. 
in the cloud, they offer a subset of the information available, really kind of reports that analyze things that you can't really change very much about the structure. But you get some cloud-based reports. We're taking this robot structural analysis to the application. Um, this is uh, downloadable from the App Exchange. Okay. The other way is if you're going to eTabs, there's a CSI X Reddit connector in eTabs. And it worked together to go through and share models from Reddit to eTabs. And I think eTabs is installed on all these computers now, too. So we should be pretty well equipped, regardless of uh, what your analysis preference is. The idea is we go through and use either of those plugins to go through and round trip it. And then the important thing to think about is really what the scope of your analysis is, really what it is that you're going to select. Because very often for your structure, there's a lot going on. You don't want to try to analyze it all. So what we try to do is actually select a subset of your structure and send that to the analysis instead. But let's go ahead and get a sense of what that looks like. So I'm going to go back over to Revit just so I can demonstrate this. And what I'm going to start by doing is just opening, oh, what is it? It's in the session 11 folder. We have those structural analysis examples. It's 11 on the server. It's 10 in my folder. Say I'll go to the Revit models. I'm going to open up the steel one just because that's an easy one for me to understand. Honestly, I understand steel design better than concrete. So I'll be the first to share that in terms of what's going on. It's easy to do the analysis on steel and wood. Concrete's a little bit stranger. It's a very different beast in terms of how you actually go through and size things. OK, it's uploading again. This is this very simple one frame structure. Again, I like to start with very simple structures just to get a sense of what's going on with the tool and then go through and expand the structures out to things that are a little bit more interesting. So let's see what this one looks like again. It should be four columns, some beams, and some loads on it right now. It's actually looking pretty good right now. So right now this has this live load of around 50 pounds per square foot. It has these little uh, boundary conditions over here. I believe these are fixed right now. Yes. So they're actually going to be um, introducing a little bit of moment resistance there too. So the columns are going to contribute to help sort of uh, handle some of the uh, lateral loads. Okay. Let's go through, and if I wanted to add another uh, sort of uh, load to this, I could go back to analyze. Let me just put a little uh, a dead load on here, too, so we have a couple different cases. I'll say dead loads. Again, I can host an area load if I want to go through and have it all over the place. If I want to sort of put it in a specific place or put it on a specific beam or even just put a specific point load in there, not to worry, I can go through and do that. So, for example, if I wanted to go through and just put a point load on a specific spot, that's interesting. It looks like it has to be on top of the beam. Which one do I have to have it on? Place it on, this, on the end point of a beam bracer column. Ah, so I can do it there. Let me go ahead. I'm just going to put a little area load on this just so we have another case. I'll say, let's put a dead load on it of like 100 pounds per square foot, just so we have something. Posted area load, a dead load of, I'll say, minus 0.1 kips per square foot. Okay, so I have two loads on there. Beautiful. We are ready to analyze. And this is where we left off last time. We went ahead and we said, great, let's go to the analyze. And we are going to do some structural analysis. Now, in terms of the structural analysis, if you put in the structural analysis plug-in to Revit, okay, which is now installed on these machines, and you can install it on your machine, we can go ahead and analyze in the cloud. So if you don't have any structural analysis tools and you just want to use a cloud-based version of a robot, you can. I can say analyze in the cloud. It's going to check to see am I entitled to use this. I think we're all entitled to use this as student users. 
going to extract the model. That sounds pretty similar. We're going to go through and just pull out the line model, the analytical model, verify the model, upload it. Now it's going to ask us some questions about what type of analysis we would like to have performed. So, oh, I can choose, what do I want here? Whether I want a static or a gravity analysis. I'll say normal, simple report, that sounds fine. Add the dead weight to, a self weight to dead load one. Super. I like that cloud credits available, infinity. That looks good. So I'll save that away. And it's going to go off to the cloud. So it's going to start doing some structural analysis out there. It's sort of interesting to see what it gives back as opposed to what the structural analysis will give back. OK. I think it's going to mail us or turn off some messages when it's all done. I'm just going to let that kind of work away. Actually, let's do this. I'm going to open up that first just so you can sort of see what it looks like. Here's the structural analysis dashboard. This is very much like the rendering gallery. There's all these cloud-based services Autodesk offers. Looks like here's the analysis that's working away right now. If you want to go back and take a look at some other analysis, you can. So I got some points from the last quarter. Let's go ahead and oh, just take a look at any of these. I can get done. This is going pretty quickly. Back over here. Oh, let's take a look at this one just as a starting point. In terms of what it reports out, let's take a look at the simple report and see what it actually includes. There it is down in my little PDF writer. Let's see if I can open that up. So what is actually in here? Let's go through and take a look. So to report on the basic model itself, that sounds pretty good. The different load cases. It's going to show us the reactions. So at the four different corners, we have uh, just the different reactions for each of the different load cases. Next, nodal supports, displacements. This is like a, how much things are displacing in each of the nodes. We have here elements with maximum forces. So it looks like those three columns, or as far as it's concerned, have some uh, high uh, extremes. Looks like the what the slab itself and the stress in the slab. So I, as it gets back towards the corners, you're starting to see a lot of kind of much higher stresses there. Yeah, not so bad in the center, but as we get towards those columns, because those columns are kind of resisting. So they are providing a little uh, kind of stress there. Cases. A lot of stuff comes out of here. Okay. A lot of stuff comes that way. But I tend not to look at it this way because those reports are interesting, but they don't really give me access to what I really want, which is the ability to go through and kind of size up all the members independently. So what I tend to do is I'll come either to robot structural analysis or take it over to ETABs. Let's take it over to robot first. Now, if you're coming to Robot, here's what I recommend doing. Go ahead and open Robot first, because what happens is sometimes when you open Robot, especially for the first time, it puts up a little dialogue that sort of says, hey, can we collect data about your usage? Or it has something that requires you to say, OK, go splash me. Okay. So it's actually better to open it so it's hanging around and you're past that point, okay, and then send it over. So we can say, great, let's go ahead. Let me go back over to Revit. I'll say, let's send this over to Robot. I'm going to send the model. Notice I could also update the model. OK, 
Okay, I'm sending it as opposed to bringing it back right now. Updating would actually kind of come back this way. Direct integration versus sort of saving a file. And the big thing to watch out for here is this choice. If I have things selected, I can only send the current selection. So let's talk about how we can use that. For example, I got a whole structure kind of hanging out here. If I really only want to uh, model or send out the loads or send out the analysis for this one uh, subsection here, okay, what I can do is go through and only select specific parts of it. So I can go through and select that. It's like the whole load there. That beam right there. This beam right here. Can't tell if I had that one selected. I gotta get the boundary conditions, because the boundary conditions have to come across. I'm in a little bit of a hole right now because the loads are area loads as opposed to being line loads. So I don't want to send the whole area load because that would be unbalanced. It's not supported on the other side. So what I would need to do is for my purposes is just put a line load there, which is the equivalent of what the area load is. So I'd say I take the area load, and really, if it's this end beam over here, it's only applied to like it's half the distance to the next one. So the tributary area is probably only about two feet wide applied to this. So these loads, you know, times the two feet apply as a line load is supposed to be an area load. If I was doing for this beam across the front instead, I would actually apply half the load over this way. Okay, so yeah, as you're going through and doing your sub-analysis, you have to kind of sometimes do a little playing around with the loads to get exactly what you need. But so what we're doing, I'm just going to send the whole thing because this is pretty simple. So I'll send it on over. It's exporting. It's going. Here go the area loads. And it should send it over to Robot Structural and open it there. Check that out. It says it's sending. Let's see if it makes it. Not that the uh, structural analysis is complete in the cloud. Okay, I don't want to see the events report. I'm just going to go right over, and here is, again, that equivalent structure. So you can use these little widgets at the bottom to go ahead and turn on different things. For example, I could show, oh, just the sizes. There's a lot of things I could show the bar sizes, panel descriptions, bar numbers. These are actually sort of useful. As we're going to go through and do our analysis in just a minute here, it's actually helpful to know what the bar numbers are. One, two, three, four being the columns, seven and eight being the kind of heavily loaded girders, five and six being the less loaded girders. And 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 being the interior ones. So if you want to go through and analyze this, again, what you do is you start by going under the results tab and just say, oh, excuse me, the analyze tab, analysis tab, and say calculations. We'll let it go ahead and run. And based on all the current sizes of the members, it'll distribute those loads around and figure out what the stresses and strains are there. When I get this one back, I tend to turn off the nodes just because those little red nodes actually on the uh, slab kind of get in the way of things when you're trying to select things. So I tend to turn them off. But now I can, again, for any individual member, choose it and say, let's take a look at its properties. So I could display the properties and show the bending moments. Can show the displacement, or I can look at the code check. And this is the one we remember last time. It was a little bit out of whack. It's overstressed right now. Actually, right now, last time it was only overstressed by a little. It was one point something or other, one point two. It's a little more overstressed now because now that I've added a dead load on top of the live load, there's more load on it, so it's even more in trouble than it was before. So our results today will be a little bit different than they were last time because I've added a different set of loads to it. Okay, so that's not looking too bad. 
Let me pause there for people who are following along or people trying to follow along and sort of see what that's like. If you can, it's just kind of doing its thing. Okay. Looks like we're trying there. Okay. People working. Doing good. That's okay. Great. Let us go ahead and. Okay. If you want to send that on over, let's go to. It's under the Analyze tab. We'll say robot structural analysis link. And you got robot open in the background too. Let's go ahead and open that up just so that it is there. Excellent. Just because in case that dialog comes up, looks like you're in good shape. Say to Revit. Say OK. It's a coming. And you should be back up to this point in just a second here. Uh -huh. There's the OK that I always worry about. Looks like an untone run, unknown run of tight error. Don't say okay. You're getting that too. You're getting that too. Let's go again. Try run. Let's try sending it again. I'm a little confused about what it is. I mean, you're never quite sure. Specify that. That should be okay. Say okay again. I wonder if it's a version thing. Again, interesting. Don't know what that is. Hmm. Let's see what you're doing on yours. What's that? That is actually coming through. Okay, you're okay. Here's kind of a flat view, but you're okay. <laughs> What's going on? Don't know. There's something going on with something that's just not quite in sync just yet. So you might have to look a little kind of software and storage and stuff. You might try on the, the big computer, you know, on the live computer, or just follow along for right now. Just walk along. Send the model. Well, I'm sure is. Why don't you close robot and let's reopen it? Just see if that makes any difference at all. Ah, because in robot, is that window still open? Go look at the windows that are open on robot and go to that one. Say OK to that. Now, are there two versions? There might be two windows open. Try closing them. I think there might actually be two of them open. Now try setting it. It looks like it sure looks like it's trying. Nope, still unknown. Un un you might try again just closing all both versions of the robot out. You know, then try that. And then we just have to look at some sort of software installation problems. I think actually I don't yeah, playing around in here, I have a hard time doing that too. So yeah, you know, I wouldn't even worry about it now. Or I would just close it and send it over again. Yes. Okay, now, for you, that notice that it, yeah, the whole thing about whether that checkbox about opening or closing that splash screen every time, yeah, I think that would make a difference there. We'll see if it'll make any difference for you. Don't know. Again, it, when it's an unknown, unknown runtime error, it's just some sort of software installation thing. Don't know. Yeah. I was getting there too. Okay. Uh, Hold on to Peter for now. <laughs> He's got it going. Come along. Come along. <laughs> okay. okay, so here's the deal. We've got this model here, pending uh, different software installation hassles. We've got this uh, system working together. Let's show you how you can work with this. What you're going to do is as follows. You can size up anything individually. For example, I could go through and just say that, hey, I want to change that W12 by 26 and choose one of the other available sizes. Notice there aren't very many available sizes right now. I could go ahead and say that I want to go to the 16 by 40 or I go by the 12 by, looks like 265 or is 12 by 26? 12 by 26. I don't really have very many good sizes to work with. It's always sort of interesting. The 16 by 40 or the 10 by 49, that might actually work. You know, it just sort of varies. You're never quite sure what the right size is because the relationship between the weight per lineal foot and the thickness of the flanges versus the depth, it's a little subtle in terms of really what's going to be the best choice. It'll actually help us figure out what the best choice is okay, based on a criteria where you want to make, minimize the minimum, minimum weight per uh, foot or 
whether you want to minimize the deflection, whatever it is you're interested in minimizing. But rather than doing it manually, let's go ahead and let it help us decide. So how this works is under the design tab, you can say steel members design. Kind of brings up a slightly different view. The thing I did last time, which was the really easy thing to do, is just do sort of member verification. Okay, member verification is kind of okay. That's just basically check to see how everything is looking in terms of whether they're meeting code. Right now that's set up so that it's only going to member verify member number seven, because that's what's selected over here. Let me go ahead, I'm going to go to this little list and say, hey, I don't want to do just member seven. I really want to get all of the members. So I could say uh, section any. I could type just 1, 2, 13 in there. There's a number of ways you can put it in here. But basically, you want to go through and get all the members in there. I'll say any of them. Okay, and notice it changes to 1 to 13 because I'm basically allowing any of those bars. So great. We'll close that up and we will say, let's go ahead and do some calculations. And as it did its calculations, it kind of flew by. Here's this uh, messages window, which is telling us some of the things we need to work on. But in particular, over here, you'll see that 7 and 8 are a little bit undersized. We sort of get an overall sense of efficiency right now. Here we have, these were much less the other day, 0 0.41, 0 0.40. The columns all have very similar efficiency to them right now. They're about 40% used. The girders, those big girders 7 and 8, they're about three and a half times used. So you probably need to raise those up. Things like the columns can probably shrunk down a little bit. Based upon what we're doing. We can go ahead and look at all these different load cases independently. Is that going to work? Yeah, let's leave that one for now. If we want to go through and now think about how to resize those, here's how it basically works in this program. Every program is a little bit different. The way it works if we want to think about designing members is we tend to think about them in groups. Let's talk about what a group is. A group is different elements that you all want to have sized together. So you tend to put things in groups based on like functionality. So for example, one, two, three, and four, the four different columns sort of make sense. They're similar in functionality. They're probably going to be similar in sizing. Seven and eight, my kind of collector girders, those are similar in functionality, so I'd probably put those together. Five and six, my end girders, again, those are similar, so I'd probably put them in a group. And finally, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13, they're similar. So those are like more joists. So the idea is, Think about where the similarity is, and then based upon that, we'll go through and group things, because when you group things, what you're doing is you're not designing every member individually, you're design, designing for the group of members. Okay, so the same members will select all of them, and three or four of them, depending on what's in there. So let's show you how that works. Over here, I could say that, oh, in the groups, I want to go through and create a new group. That's group number one. Okay, in terms of the members to put in there, let's go ahead and think about which members I want to put in there. I could put in there that I want to put one, two, three, and four. Okay, so one to four. I'm going to call those my columns. So I can save that away. That's going to be my group number one. I'm going to do something similar for the other one. I'm going to create a series of groups. Now, in terms of what I would allow to be in, or to apply to members one to four, I can choose specific sections and say, this is the range of allowable sections that I would consider. Okay, and then it'll try to find the appropriate section or the most efficient section from that list of available options. So you create a group, and then you say, hey, these are the sections that could apply to it. So, Right now, there aren't that many sections. There's just the ones that came from Revit. But if I choose sections, 
I get a little database over here. I can say I want to go to the AISC 14 database. I can say that I want to go ahead and choose specific section of cross sections. I'll get all the W sections right now. Right now I have them all selected. So basically, I'm allowing that any of the wide flange sections might be appropriate. But I want to also put the tube seal sections in there and add that. I basically add these and I say OK. And then for this, those sections are available. When it's choosing, it can choose any of those available sections. I can knock out the ones I don't really want. Super. Let's go ahead and create another group. For my second group, not that. Let's go ahead and put in, for this one, I want to go through and put seven and eight together in a group. Those are the ones I'm really most concerned about. I'm going to call these my, oh, I'll call them my collector girders. I can take a look at the sections. It still has the set list of sections that I used for the uh, kind of columns. That's OK. So now I have two groups. I have group one, which is one to four, the columns. I have group two, which is the collector girders. Okay, I'm going to do two more groups. I'm going to do five and six as the end girders, and I'm going to do seven through thir or nine through thirteen as the joists. So I'll say another new group. This is going to be oh five and six. These will be called my end girders. Save that away. And finally, group four. Group four is going to be 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. I'm going to call those my joists. Super. So again, I've created these groups. And the only reason I'm creating groups is I want to sort of size them up together. OK, so we'll go through and optimize each of the ones in the family. So now that we've done that, we can say there's a code for each verification. That'll just verify everything in that one group as opposed to all the individual numbers. Okay. But what we want to take a look at is code group design. So if you say you're going to design, I'll put in some group. And in my case, I'm going to put in group number one. You can say what you would like to do. So we have all sorts of different optimization op options as it's choosing what would you prefer. You know, would you like to go ahead and go for a specific weight? Would you like to constrain things so there's a maximum or minimum height, a maximum or minimum flange thickness, a minimum web thickness? We can really sort of go up any of these different things based upon what it is that you want to sort of have be your bounding condition. I'll just go for the minimum weight. on my optimization over there. OK. Next up is I want to know what the limit states are. I'm going to leave that stuff about the same. And I'm going to go through and say, let's do some calculations. So again, I'm going to go just for the columns now. Those are code group one. So there's really just, oh, I can just even do it that way, columns there. When I say calculations, it'll go off and do some calculations. So here's what it's come up with. It, it's saying that for these columns, really what it would recommend right now is 10 by 39. It sort of thinks that's the best choice right now. 14 by 38 looks like it's a little bit undersized right now. Okay. 8 by 40 is a little oversized. The flange size is a little bit smaller. The weight per lineal foot is a little bit higher. So that's why it's putting 10 by 39 ahead of 8 by 40. So it's kind of a choice now about really which one you want. I'm going to go ahead and say, that sounds fine. I will take that. So let's go ahead and change them. Okay. What's going to happen is because it's going to change those columns to 10 by 39s, okay, it's going to need to redo the calculations because the material and the stiffness shifted around a little bit. So how things got distributed is going to change a little bit. So I'll say yes. 
Go ahead and close that up. Okay. If I come on over here, I always have to find where this is. In terms of the view options, if I want to show the member sizes, display, let's see if I can find it over here. Nodes, bars, section shapes, symbols, let's try that. Nope, that's just the bar symbol. Section shapes, section member types, legends, cables, advanced properties. What I want to do is actually just go through and put in, that was the symbol, that was the bar description. Seems like it's there. Interesting, that's at least showing which groups they all belong to. Section shape, panel description. Looks like bar description should be there, but I don't see it. As bar, no, oh, there's bar name right there. No, is that it? That's the name, that looks so close. How about the section name? Okay, that actually is true. There we go. So I have those 10 by 39s. Notice up here at the uh, upper level, I still have all these 12 by 26s. I would like to go ahead and uh, reconsider them. So how about next if we go for 7 and 8? Right now there's 12 by 26s. If you would like to go through and let's get the code list. I'm going to go for the collector girders. Okay, and say let's do some calculations based on that. What's it doing? Close that out for a second. We rerun the calculations. Okay, let's try it again. I'm going to say code group design, the collector girders. Okay, that should be fine. I'm still pointing at the columns. What is going on? Hang on. It's not sticking. That's going to stick a little bit better. Oops. In this case, actually, I got, um, did I get five and six? I really got the, hang on. It's two, not three, right? Okay. I'm just choosing the wrong ones. We'll turn on our ring. Okay. So here we go. We are looking at, we got some 12 by 26s right now. It's recommending 14 by 48s. We have some other choices. The 8 by 48, which sort of sounds attractive, a little bit shallower. Okay, um, it is a little bit overloaded, so the 14 by 48 is really what it would recommend. Okay, 21 by 48 would be, actually even that is kind of failing in its own way. Sometimes it's interesting, it has to do with just, oh, the shape itself and the distance of the flanges, you get this sort of other instability where it's just not as good a choice. So I'm gonna go through and go by those 14 by 48s. Also I'll change. Notice that it changed them over here. Go ahead and cancel that. Let me go ahead and rerun my calculations. Now we're ready for the other ones. Okay, I suspect, what do you suspect is gonna be worse off, those joists or the end girders? I'm suspecting the joists. Okay, so we'll go through and put the joists in here. Let's 
go through and run that. Instead of 12 by 26s, 8 by 24s. That's not too bad. So a little bit smaller, a little bit of a weight savings, but definitely a little bit smaller, which might help out relative to getting all our uh, mechanical in there. Pick up four inches. I'll change those. Close that on up. Okay, again, I'm going to rerun my calculations to update it so those new sizes are in there. And finally, last but not least, we'll go through and put in, is it group number three? Okay, it looks like eight by 28. Interestingly, a little bit different. Now, although I want to think of those as being a little bit less loaded from the standpoint of just kind of having the sheer gravity loads on them, they do have a little bit of kind of torquiness at the end just because of their fixed connection. So, you know, there could be a little effect that's going on in the corners just because it's transferring moments across there where it is no longer simply supported. So, I'm actually sort of surprised that they're showing up to be a little bit bigger. I think their loads are a little bit less, but it must be something about the way the loads are redistributed forces and stresses are distributed. Let's say yes to that. Great, close that up. Okay, so at this point, I have a new improved redesigned structure. So sort of based on like uh, all our latest thinking about how the codes are going to apply. And after I've done this, your structural engineer has done this, you might be saying, great, I'd like to get this back over to Revit. Okay, and I'd like to do it in a way that there's not a whole lot of transcription error. Because that's really the big enemy right now, is that we have all this information. Boy, a lot of things have changed. How are we going to get back over there and do the remodeling in Revit so that it accurately reflects what's in here and we're all in sync? So let's do this. I'm going to go through and save this model. I'll just go ahead and put it on my desktop. Okay, we would like to get this information back into Revit. So again, we have 10 by 39s, 12 by 48s, 8 by 24s. Let's go back over to Revit and see what we're looking like over here. Over here, you might remember, let me switch to the 3D view. What are we? We are... Don't fight me. Come over here. Ten, uh, what was it? Was it 10 by 49 over here? It's funny, it's catching up to me over here in the background. Okay, 10 by 49 on the column. What are these? These are 12 by 26s. These over here are 12 by 26s. So you can see they're all a little bit off relative to with the, area, the uh, updated model. What we want to do is basically bring the updated model back. And how we do that is as follows. You come on up and you say, let's go back to this robot structural analysis link. going on. I'll say robot structural analysis. This time I'm going to basically say let's go through and update the model. So I'm going to bring it on back. I'm not sure what update model and results is. It could be if results are stored here already. It's going to update those. I'm just going to update the model right now. In terms of update options, let's check it out what's going on here. Update the whole project. I could only update selected parts of the structure. Yeah, I could select modified elements in Revit structure if I only want to do those. I'm going to skip the whole thing for now. You could go ahead and just really pull in parts. So if you only updated some things over there, I only want to update these columns, update a few beams. You could pull those instead. And again, how you would do that is 
If you really only want to go through and update a few things, you choose the part that you want to update. Then I come back and do the analyze. Say let's pull that in. Okay, and now we can choose only the selected parts. Like that. But I'm actually gonna get the whole project, ignoring the selection. Okay. So we are ready. We're going to say, let's go ahead and directly pull it in. And it'll go on out. It'll grab the data from robot structural analysis. It knows there's a connection between these things if you have them uh, directly linked. If you've been saving intermediate files, you have to just go ahead and point to the file. And then bring it on back. Any changes I've made over there to either the members, to any of the loads, to the boundary conditions, anything my structural engineer changed is now going to come back over here. Let's see what it comes up with. It looks like the old bar name right there. Let's see what, what happens when the new ones come in. Okay. So let's check this out in this new improved version. We now have, when it finishes flashing, 10 by 39s on the corners. We now have a 14 by 48. We now have 8 by 24s in there. So it's actually done a pretty good job of updating them so that it reflects whatever happened over in the analysis package. And that's really what we want to be. You really want to say that in your structural model here, it always is staying up to date with what's going on in the analysis package, and there's no room for any transcription error. But at the same time, you want this to accurately update itself so you have a good spatial understanding of really how tall those are. Because if things got shorter, I think. I'm not so worried about things getting shorter. I'm more worried about when things get taller. All of a sudden now, this beam is a few inches taller, and it might be conflicting with a piece of ductwork now. Something like that. So that's what I'm after. Super. So that's basically the idea of round tripping, going back and forth through robot structural. So that's how it works there. If you're an eTabs user, it's actually amazingly similar. What I can do there is, oh, as opposed to robot structural analysis, I can come over here and it's under add-ins. If you have the CSI X Revit connector in there, you have export to create a new eTabs model. Let's go ahead and get these on out. Also, great, let's go uh, export all this. It's going to want to store it somewhere on my desktop. Let's put it out there. OK, with eTabs, what I'm going to do is uh, we installed it on all those machines as well as that connector. So if you're an eTabs user, you can think about doing it that way. I work more with robot than I do with eTabs, so I'll go that way instead. Where did eTabs go? It's not there. Where's my eTabs? There it is. eTabs is right here. Again, if you want to work with eTabs, eTabs is available. We have licenses for every student to go ahead and you can put them on their machine if you want to. It works off of a network license server, so there's some instructions on Mintopia about how you can set it up. And the big restriction is you just have to be on the Stanford network, okay, or VPN into the Stanford network. So here's eTabs. Let's go ahead and open this up. What I tend to do in eTabs is I say import, and I import a Revit structure EXR file. There it is.
doing some sort of work. We'll see what's going on. warnings in there. Let me ignore them for now. I need to save the actual eTabs file. So the project there. Okay, and here we have it. So that for eTabs users should start to look familiar. I haven't played around with eTabs in a while, but do we go to analyze or do we go, how do we get started just in terms of doing the calculations? I used to play around with this, I'd be do the deform shapes and stuff like that. As I remember, there's something about calculations in here. So check the model, set the load cases to run. Let's just run analysis. It's been a long time. I don't, I don't work with eTabs day in and day out. Looks like it's doing some analysis right now in the background there. Hmm. Looks like it deformed things right over here. It looks like the whole thing is sort of slumping down there right now. So there's some extra weight kind of hanging around in here. But in terms of all this, there's stuff about the undeformed shape versus the deformed shape. Oh, and the force and stress diagrams. Let's see if we can figure this out. Oh, I always have a hard time thinking about this stuff. Is it there? There we go. So there's the shear and bending. There's the bending moment diagrams. Uh, let's find the shear case. I think it's probably that one. Yep, the shear case right there. OK. So again, it's another analysis tool. They're really just different types of calculators. So the idea is, yeah, really get the model over, make the changes, do the analysis, if you know how to work with eTabs to go through and do that. And at the tail end of this whole process, you're going to basically say that you're going to export a Revit structure EXR file, and then you'll bring that back to Revit to do that same sort of round tripping. Okay, so definitely work with whichever tool you're more familiar with. Okay, because uh, it's really, it you know, depends on your background. And you want to be working with a familiar tool as opposed to having to learn an entirely different tool. Okay, so let me put a pause there in terms of what's going on. As far as structure goes, again, what we want you to do is really just think about some specific case in your kind of model where there's a beam or two, just something that's a little bit interesting to do, a little bit of analysis, just to have the experience. You're not doing a complete structural analysis. So just to sort of see how that round tripping works. Does that sort of make sense? I think most people have a sense of what you're going to analyze. If not, as we're meeting this week, go ahead and like ask us and we'll give you some feedback about like something that will be both interesting but not too complex. Because it probably won't be that incredibly undulating, curvaceous, something or other that's going to be a big finite element nightmare. We'll find some relatively simply supported or cantilevered beam or just something that is, you know, doable where it won't take a lot of structural knowledge as much as just, you know, kind of modeling it accurately and kind of round tripping it. Okay, let us do this then. Let us pause for right now. When we come on back, we're going to do two things. We're going to A, do some gluing of these models and kind of send them out to glue. I want to basically show the integration of the clash detection in glue. We want to actually show you with an A360 how you can not only grab a link to your model, you can actually embed the model on your web page, which is actually kind of a cool thing to do. So you don't have to click links. You can actually just see the live model. And we're going to talk about HVAC. Okay? So come on back in just a few, and we will continue.